Hello, welcome again to the episode of the Let, Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Gann. I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today I'm delighted to have someone who is on the front lines of healthcare policy and ensuring that we have affordable, quality, accessible healthcare across the United States. And it's none other than Dr. Brian Blaze. Brian, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. It is great to be with you. Thanks for having me, Vance. Awesome, Brian. Well, um, I'm looking. it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Looking forward to our discussion today. And for the audience, let me go ahead and read your bio, and then we'll jump right into it. So, Brian Blaze is the president of Paragon Health Institute. Brian was special assistant to the president for economic policy at the White House's National Economic Council from 2017 to 2019, where he coordinated the development and execution of numerous health policies and advised the president, NEC director, and senior officials. After leaving the White House, Brian founded Blaze Policy Strategy and serves as its CEO. Brian guided the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reforms, Healthcare and Entitlement Program Oversight and Investigation Efforts from 2011 to 2014, and then served the Senate Republican Policy Committee's Health Policy Analyst from 2014 to 2015. Brian is a prolific researcher and writer, authoring scores of research, studies, and policy analyses, regularly writing commentary for The Wall Street Journal, New York Post, The Hill, and others. Brian received his PhD in economics from George Mason University. He lives in Florida with his wife and five children. So, Brian, it's really a pleasure to have you on the program. We've got a lot to talk about, but the first thing I want to talk about is why do you do what you do every day? I mean, I got into public policy to make people's lives better and I think uh, to get a more prosperous society where people are able to live to their potential, maximize their potential. And if you're interested in public policy and you've got sort of free market, limited government inclinations, you should quickly realize how important healthcare is. It's an overwhelming part of our government's budget. And there's so many government policies and programs that really work against our health and economic well-being. So I get up every day uh, trying to improve the incentives in our healthcare sector um, so that we're the more aligned towards maximizing value and not just sort of transferring as much money from the middle class to the healthcare uh, industrial complex as possible. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, you've been doing this for a while now. And uh, yeah, if, if you could kind of maybe go through a little bit of your journey, I read over the bio and kind of the, the different pieces, but you've got a lot of history in, in this area and, and how you got into it, I think was also really interesting with Obamacare and everything else. But but how, how would you tell your story? So I was taking graduate classes. I was getting my PhD in economics at George Mason and took some health economics classes and really learned a lot about problems within our healthcare system. And that a lot of government policy focused on the wrong things, like so much government attention on health insurance coverage, even though health insurance coverage is pretty loosely related to people's overall health and well-being. So I was in graduate school and I got an opportunity, a foot in the door. And I think it's really important once you get your foot in the door um, in what you think you are uh, really want to focus on to work really hard. Um, and I got my position as a graduate research fellow at the Heritage Foundation just a month before Obamacare passed and became law. And I was in that graduate fellow capacity when Heritage needed a new policy analyst to work on the healthcare law. So they hired me. I was in the right place at the right time. I got really interesting aspects of Obamacare to analyze. Um, I was only in Heritage for about a year, and then I went to Congress uh, for three and a half years, led the House Oversight Committee's oversight of Obamacare and entitlement programs. It was awesome work, sort of learning about the importance of overseeing the executive branch and the bureaucracy as they were trying to stand up. Really, if you think of Obamacare as the biggest expansion of government up to that point in time um, in decades. So being at the front lines there, uh, I then went to the Senate Republican Policy Committee, to the Mercatus Center uh, for about a year and a half. And I was in that position when President Trump got elected and I got asked to serve in the White House at the National Economic Council. And that's really the pinnacle if you want to affect policy to be in the White House in a policy role. What the National Economic Council does is coordinate the economic policy of the president. And what I really did was uh, run what I called uh, the tri-department uh, health care process. So that involved overseeing the work of health and human services, uh, the Labor Department, and Treasury has related to health care and trying to carry out the president's priorities 
um, with regulatory activity coming from those departments. Yeah, and it, it, that's awesome. And it, it, it's interesting, too, that you kind of started with Obamacare, which was a great learning lesson as you are as you dive into it, something deep. You know, right around that time, um, I was in grad school getting my PhD in economics, and um, it, the great financial crisis happened. And so that was another period to really learn and dig into what was happening. And, and I, I started learning more about monetary policy and the healthcare policy. You're right. It's so important. It touches on so much of our economy, of our daily lives, um, of our kids' lives <laughs> and, and everything else. And so it is really important. I wonder, you know, given that history that you've had, what were some of the successes and challenges that you faced over that period? It's these crises that always grow government, too. Yeah, and that's right. Hard. It's hard to uh, unwind to the level of government that existed before the crises, which is one of the concerns you know, coming out of the uh, the COVID pandemic, is getting the government uh, back to where it was pre-pandemic. You know, I think I could take a while and talk about lessons learned. Clearly, Obamacare was not politically popular at the time that it passed. It caused a lot of disruptions. Uh, promises that President Obama made. Um, were clearly broken, um, such as if you like your health insurance plan, you could keep it. If you like your doctor, you could keep it. The Republican Party was very uh, took advantage politically of the missteps and the overreach. But when it came chance it came down to governing in 2017 with unified Republican control of the executive branch and legislative branch, it was really a great opportunity to roll back the excess of Obamacare. It was never going to become repeal of the law, root and branch. I mean, I think that's where conservatives were. I was certainly more in the camp of um, repealing as much as possible. But I mean, there was a great opportunity to reduce um, uh, the counterproductive government policies, to rationalize some of the uh, subsidization and, and tax policies. And it really fell by the wayside. But that, now that has motivated me and that motivated the rest of my White House work to do whatever we could administratively to help people that have been harmed by Obamacare. And I guess this is another lesson. One, I learned how the administrative process works. I also learned how much uh, authority and power Congress has granted to the executive branch uh, to sort of make law, right? I mean, they're supposed to find statutory authority for all of this rulemaking, but so much of health policy is made by the bureaucracy, principally the bureaucracy um, at the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And uh, for better or worse, and I think it's probably for worse that Congress has abdicated so much authority to the executive branch. When you do have control of the executive branch, there is an opportunity to implement your agenda and put your stamp on policy. And that's what we really tried to do um, to roll back uh, some of the problematic parts of Obamacare uh, and to provide people that have been hurt by the law options uh, for, for more affordable coverage. Yeah, and it, it did a great job of that. I know that there was um, a lot of effort that that took because there were so many aspects of Obamacare and and everything else. And I, I think before we go too much in the details of, of what all some of those regulations were and everything, maybe just to take a little bit of a step back is to think about like how we got here, <laughs> right? Like with healthcare the way that it is now and based on um, employer provided health insurance and Medicaid and Medicare and Medicaid and Medicare are both um, created in what, 1965. So we've had those for and nearly 60 years now. But but even before that, it was really during the the, the 1930s when and, and the Great Depression, when you had this employer provided tax credits in the late 1930s, um, when that really got started. Is, is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, we could never build a healthcare system as complicated and confusing, like by design, right? Yeah. So it's sort yeah. of out of World War II. So a lot of evil comes from government price controls. Yes. And you never know exactly what the unintended consequence of government price controls are. But to your point, there was concern by the Roosevelt administration of spiraling wages and prices, inflation. And one of the ways they tamped down on that was um, restricting the growth of wages. Well, one of the uh, main takeaways whenever you see a price control is folks are gonna try to get around the price control. So yeah. how do they get around the price control if you cap wages? Well, you look for other benefits that employers could provide. And one of the other benefits that they could provide was health insurance. So you started getting more employers providing health insurance. And then the IRS made a decision that the health insurance provided by employers would be a tax-free benefit. 
So really an incentive of employers to overprovide on health insurance because there was no uh, tax liability from yep. compensation in that form. So what you you had that system sort of evolve, and now you know half of Americans get health insurance through their employer or the employer of a loved one, and then you had sort of the um, uh, the overwhelming Democratic minorities after the 1964 election that pursued big government across the board. You know the so-called Great Society that enacted Medicare and Medicaid, which you know obviously there's there's benefits from these programs and you know seniors on Medicare um, certainly get a, a benefit um, from the program. But the average senior now has only paid uh, $1 for every $3 that they're getting in benefits. And it creates a system where the Medicare bureaucracy sets prices. So they determine what gets reimbursed in the healthcare sector and what the reimbursement rates are. So rather than sort of prices being set by supply and demand relative to alternatives, you have a political structure that sets the reimbursement rates and where um, obviously there's a lot of inertia because you have the status quo and the uh, actors that benefit from the status quo that don't want to be disrupted, which creates sort of healthcare is very different the way that the economics of healthcare work than almost every other sector of the American economy. Yep. Yeah, it, uh, that's right. I think you laid it out well there, Brian. And it's it's interesting because I asked the question, okay, why do we need government involvement at all? You know, and I, and I guess the argument is that there's a market failure, that the that the market is somehow failing to bring together the suppliers that we need in order to meet the demand. And, and some people are not going to have the funds with which to pay for those services that are being rendered. And so, you know, there was some need for government to come in and solve the problem. And then there's a lot of talk about that today, whether it's expanding Medicaid or uh, Medicare for all or something else that's going on, nationalized health care. But the issue is, is there's already a lot of government involvement. <laughs> You know, I, I remember, and you probably know, you would know the exact number, but I thought it was around 60 cents of every dollar that's spent in healthcare is by government, which is really the taxpayer. Is that still about right? Yeah, I think during COVID, it probably, uh, it got definitely over 50%. Um, but yep. right now, it's about half of all spending goes through um, the government. And if you include like government tax programs and you include mm. the if you include the exclusion, you're looking at more than eight out of every $10 wow. um, affected by government um, tax or spending policy. Wow. Yeah. And so you, you you wonder why people would wonder why, OK, why are prices so high? Why, why are we not getting the care that's being provided? And 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 instead of doubling down and saying, you know, let's just put in more government, um, which two wrongs don't make a right here. Uh, and I think those causes even more problems in the process. It's like, OK, well, let's figure out a way to let the market work where people can come together. I mean, it, it, Brian, my, my view on it in a lot of ways is that there's a lot of perceived market failures that indicate that we need government to come in and solve the problem, but we forget about all the government failures that that happen. And whether it be in healthcare, education is another big one, <laughs> um, or a lot of other areas throughout our economy. And something that's so important is healthcare, which for, for my grandparents or for my parents, and both of my parents have passed away now, but both of them had uh, a lot of there's a there's a lot of you know touching with the the healthcare system and so I learned a lot about it a lot of the hoops that you go through and everything else and it and it and a lot of it is driven by the, like you were saying the CMS the regulations the all the other stuff that the Congress passes these huge bills that then gives a lot of the regulatory authority and other th sort of authority to government bureaucrats in the process. And, and as you mentioned earlier, it's very difficult uh, for us to think about how we could have created as something so complicated <laughs> as our current healthcare system that that I, I really think it, it's folks like you, Brian, that are taking a step back and really taking a deep dive in that that are leading leading the way. And 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 so I, I wonder kind of with the work that you worked on at, at the White House, what were some of the regulations that that you helped to change that are moving us in the right direction or, or maybe something else that you would really want to to highlight here? Yes. Yeah, so let me um, uh, make a couple points and then I'll get sure. to the uh, regulations, Vance. Yeah. So if you look at the creation of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, prior to that, healthcare inflation didn't drastically exceed inflation in other sectors of the economy, right? But with the introduction of Medicare, the main way that Medicare uh, paid for care was cost-based reimbursement. 
So basically, hospitals would just submit whatever the costs were for uh, the, the care that they provided to patients, and Medicare would pay that, no questions asked. So you had annual inflation uh, in healthcare spending for Medicare's introduction of like 20%. Now that lasted for a few years, and then Congress was like, well, this is the Medicare program is costing much more than anybody expected at the time. And then there was you know, different sort of technocratic ways to revise the uh, payment structure. And a lot of the reforms actually happened at the beginning of the Reagan administration. They said, we can't do cost-based reimbursement anymore. Um, this is going to bankrupt the country. So they came up with an, a very complicated sort of perspective. It's called prospective payment system, where they develop the sort of the prices in advance for the services that are charged. But still, it's government setting the reimbursement rates. Um, the way that government reimburses uh, physicians is to have a committee that's really um, dominated by the American Medical Association that does the valuations based on the physician time. Um, so you've got like lots of problems caused by the government payment programs. You also have problems caused by government regulation. So there is something called certificate of need loss, which uh, if you were a uh, provider in certain areas and you wanted to expand your capacity or you wanted to bring a new facility online, you would have to apply to the government for permission to do that. So the government would be evaluating whether that facility was needed. Worse is that the board was often dominated by the incumbent firms and the innovators, the entrepreneurs were trying to compete against. Wow. So you have just so sort of totally about the most anti-competitive policy um, that exists. And uh, if, if the federal government actually required uh, states to have certificate of need laws mm. um, at a certain point of time, it was try they were trying to do this to reduce cost pressures. It turns out that they don't reduce cost pressures and they should be repealed. But still, certificate of need laws exist um, to, to this day in about two thirds of states. Yeah. Um, and, and just real quick there too, Brian, it's, 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 it's interesting because basically what you're saying is that in a lot of ways, we're restricting the supply by, by government. And at the same time, we are subsidizing demand. So, so you have supply curve that's kind of fixed, you have the demand curve shifting up. Of course, you're going to see higher prices. And you know, uh, Marge Perry over at AEI, American Enterprise Institute, uh, he always puts up this chart, I think every six months, yeah. it's kind of the chart of the quote unquote, the chart of the century, which is good. It shows, you know, hospital services prices and, and other prices. Um, and it shows inflation, and it shows wage growth. And the two, the, the ones that are always the highest are hospital services. And, and, and it's like, okay, it's no wonder because government is so involved in in restricting the supply and increasing demand artificially in the process. <laughs> yep, uh, exactly right. And basic economics shows when you shift the curves that way, you're going to get higher prices. Yeah. Um, and the other thing government does, and this is a problem with Obamacare, is that it requires more insurance coverage. So you have to buy insurance coverage now that covers basically everything. Um, you can't sort of pick out, well, what, you know, if you want a, you know, catastrophic no frills plan, Obamacare did uh, outlawed uh, those for the most part with its, uh, and it's, it, it outlawed them and then it subsidizes the extremely comprehensive mandate laden um, policies. So government is pushing prices upward in just about every way. And then when they get concerned about the price inflation, their solution is to think about price controls and um, uh, sort of negating sort of all the damage um, that price controls have throughout the economy. So let me let me get to your question on um, uh, the regulatory actions that the, yeah. the administration pursued. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the process of how this all works. And I'll Good. start with sort of an interesting um, story. So repeal and replace, you know, it, it falls apart at the end of September. It actually fell apart a few months after John McCain had the thumbs down. That wasn't the end of the process. Uh, we continued to work on it. There was another legislative package called the Graham-Cassidy that I spent a lot of time working on in September of 2017. But when that collapsed at the end of September, you know, President Trump often did these impromptu uh, meetings with the press on his way to Marine One to take him to Andrews Air Force Base. And he was doing one and said, don't worry, my team has been working on this. I've got an executive order. It's getting ready to sign. It's going to um, uh, help a lot of people. I mean, it's going to involve you know, buying businesses, buying through associations. 
So, you know, the uh, White House staff that works on health policy saw this press conference and most of them were horrified because they were like, <laughs> we don't have, we, the president's referring to this executive order. We don't have an executive order. We're not ready to go um, on administrative actions. Fortunately, NEC, we had drafted an executive order several months ago. It was fairly generic. It was just it was directing the departments to pursue principles of um, maximizing consumer and patient choice, maximizing uh, competitive forces in healthcare in sort of all of the regulatory world. And we, what we did is we put three policies that we thought we could enact through the administrative process into that executive order. Um, the president would sign it uh, two weeks later, I think called expanding uh, health care choice and competition across the United States. And that set in place three um, regulatory actions, an expansion of association health plans, which is a way that businesses can join together and small businesses can get some of the regulatory advantages that big businesses get in offering health insurance, um, an expansion of what's called short term limited duration insurance, which is coverage that Congress exempted from federal health insurance regulation. It became increasingly attractive during Obamacare because people couldn't afford the Obamacare plans, so they purchased these products. The Obama administration had restricted people's ability to purchase them, um, basically reduced the amount of time. Uh, we wanted to go in the other direction and undo the Obama administration restrictions. And then finally, a policy that would allow employers, rather than um, offering health coverage where the employer has to select the plan for everybody at the firm. The employer would provide a contribution, you know, would be tax preferred, and the employee could then use that contribution to purchase a plan that works best for them. So the executive order um, flagged those three items. And then basically the next almost two years of my time in the White House was spent uh, moving those regulations through the proper process. Um, and getting them to be codified or uh, promulgated in the code of the Federal Register. Yeah, and, and that process is pretty long, right? There's the comment period and other things that are going on. It, were there were there any things that you'd want to share about that process uh, that that you found of interest? All of those healthcare, the Department of Labor was the uh, lead on okay. the association health plans, but the other two regulations were tri department rules, so mm -hmm. HHS, Labor, and Treasury. And it was a it was a great product. So what I would do is every week I would host a 90 minute meeting. I bring all the departments and sort of the agencies within those departments like CMS and the IRS into a big conference room in the executive office building. And we would work through the issues. We would sort of decide the policies. We'd review if there were drafts. We would review draft. We would sort of comment and discuss those drafts. And, you know, it sort of goes sequentially. It's very hard to focus on more than one big thing at a time. So we started with association health plans, moved to short-term plans, and then finalized with um, and did the individual coverage HRAs last. But you're right, it, is, it, is, it does take time. So it's um, actually a lesson for um, thinking through the next administration that they have plans that are ready to go day one. Like they know what the proposed rules are. They sort of have some thoughts on what the preamble of those proposed rules will uh, contain so that you don't waste time. Because I think you cannot, the last year of an administration, political factors sort of overwhelm everything and it's hard to do big changes. You don't want to spend the whole first year trying to get yourself organized. Yep. Yep. Uh, wise words, Brian. And I think that there's a lot of effort to to put something out there. I know Heritage has Project 2035, uh, 2025, and there's other things that are out there to really get that process started. I know that you're working on a lot of this as well at the, the Paragon Institute. And as we move on to some of this other stuff, what are some of the other key areas of the Paragon Institute that, that you're really working on? So we've got four initiatives at Paragon. We got private health reform, Medicare reform, Medicaid and health safety net reform, and um, then public health and American well-being. We're looking at sort of what are big policy changes that you'd obviously need legislation for, and we're gonna put out some proposals across each of those initiatives, as well as um, what are administrative uh, action items that you know you get a sympathetic administration in there that wants to maximize uh, choice, competition, innovation, and healthcare. What are a set of policies that they can hit the ground with um, on day one? I'll start with private health reform. Vance, I know you've talked about this um, in the past, but Congress has really set themselves up 
in 2025 with a lot of expiring tax provisions. Mm -hmm. um, there's thought of how you could use reconciliation to um, extend some of the expiring tax provisions and, and do some reforms. Um, one of the big ones that is expiring is Obamacare enhanced subsidies. The American Rescue Plan and then the Inflation Reduction Act contained a big increase in Obamacare subsidies, but only through 2025. There will be pressure to extend those. I do not think Congress should extend the Obamacare subsidies past 2025. But what we need are other proposals to provide Congress when they get the sort of inevitable uh, pressure that you know you can't you can't take away subsidy from people that are that are benefiting from it. Um, so that's sort of one key area where we're going to come up with probably several uh, reforms of Obamacare premium tax credit structure so that there are alternatives um, to just you know continuing to throw money at health insurance companies to prop up the Obamacare exchanges. On Medicare, our big proposal is going to be around Medicare Advantage. I think we recognize that Med Medicare Advantage is um, another way that seniors get Medicare benefits, where the senior uh, has an insurance plan with Humana, Elevance, which used to be Anthem, and uh, the insurance plan coordinates their care and pays for uh, their services. We think there's advantages uh, to Medicare Advantage over traditional Medicare. We think that there's a lot of reforms of Medicare Advantage that are needed, and we think uh, we want Medicare Advantage to cost less to the federal government than traditional Medicare. Um, and if it costs less, because right now it costs two or 3% more on average, if it costs less, then it really makes it an easy case and make them conservative to say, we wanna get as many people in Medicare Advantage as possible. Public health, that area post COVID, I think it's pretty clear, needs a whole scale reform of the bureaucracy of the apparatus. Uh, Paragon just released a paper uh, last month, uh, starting with CDC reform, we're going to have some work that comes out on NIH reform. And then uh, Medicaid, Medicaid policy right now is just a mess coming out of the pandemic. Um, there's a lot um, on Medicaid that needs fixing. I'll just flag one crucial policy reform for conservatives on Medicaid, and it relates to Obamacare. So Obamacare drastically expanded the program to able bodied working age adults. And in doing so, it discriminated against traditional Medicaid enrollees. The federal government reimburses 90% of the cost of the expansion, these able-bodied working age uh, enrollees, and a much lower percentage for the traditional populations, you know, pregnant women, children, uh, age, uh, aged, and people with disabilities. The federal government should not discriminate against those categories in favor of the able-bodied um, the 90% MAP rate is way too high. It incentivizes states to recklessly spend um, through the Medicaid program, and that reimbursement rate needs to be brought down um, to what the federal government pays for the rest of um, Medicaid employees. Yeah, and those are all those are all great, Brian. And, and you're right; there are so many perverse incentives that are out there. Um, you're also correct to put out that 2025 is going to be a big year. Um, not only with those healthcare related changes, but also the individual income tax rate changes from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, those also expire. There's a there's going to be a, a wide opening for some key reforms to take place, which is why, you know, 2024 will be a key election year. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens then as we move forward into next year. But I, and we're recording this August 22nd, 2023. I did want to mention that and I'll put that in the show notes as well, uh, which people can find at vancegan.substack.com. You know, when you're talking about all these different factors that have been going on, is you're also right about how COVID kind of changed the landscape to some extent. I mean, it, it, it took all these programs and with the emergency declarations that were put in place early on, I think, you know, arguably those are the right things to do. You know, given that all the, the country was shut down, um, how people, people, many people are losing their jobs. 22 million people lost their jobs between the months of March and April. We just recently got back to those numbers, the, the employment levels that we were before. And, and so that puts a lot of stress on people. And it was basically a way to say, look, you can get on Medicaid, but but you don't have to worry about aging out or income out. I mean, they took put a lot of waivers in place to, and, and that's kept people on Medicaid for three years that ordinarily wouldn't have been on. I mean, they would be ineligible given the eligibility criteria that many of these states have in place. Um, and a lot of those were rolled back or, or, or removed this year. 
um, earlier this year. Some states are, I think, are still, it's, it, you know, they're still making their changes to their eligibility criteria. Um, but this is going to be a pretty big shock for a, a lot of individuals across families across the country as that goes away. And and it, it's one of those things where, like Milton Friedman said, um, nothing is as permanent as a temporary government program. And, and it incentivizes, I think, the government, the regulators uh, out there, where they're going to hear a lot from their constituents <laughs> to continue this program. And, and I'm hopeful that we can have a way to fight back, which is why it's so great that you're doing what you're, what you're doing, Brian. Um, but but have you noticed some of those as well, like your research and, and others, is that we're becoming more and more dependent on government. And it's going to be more difficult to roll this stuff back. And as the states are more dependent on the, you know, quote unquote, federal funding. It's all from the taxpayers, whether it's out of your left pocket or right pocket, it's coming out of the taxpayer's pocket, um, that they're seeing a larger and larger share of their budget is coming from federal funds. And if that starts to dry up with $33 trillion in debt, or if there's changes to the health care policy, there's going to be, there, there's just a lot of changes that I can see over the next few years. Um, but, I, but I wonder what you're thinking. I'll pick your brain about it. Great question. And this is uh, very much of an interest area of mine. I'm going to start by um, uh, recommending a paper the Paragon put out generally on the COVID pandemic and state's response to the pandemic. So we did a evaluation of so basically on the uh, horizontal axis, we had a measure of states COVID restrictions and that came from Oxford University. So Paragon did not create that measure. And on the vertical axis was a bunch of um, economic health and education outcomes. And what we found is that states that had more restrictive COVID policies performed worse than states with less restrictive COVID policies. It sort of relied more on people um, to make the best decisions for themselves of how to manage the risks with the um, with the virus. So um, states like Florida that kept schools open um, performed much better. Basically, they they did about average, a little above average on the health measures, did really well on economic and education measures relative to other states like you know California. Um, that pursue broad lockdowns. Now, on one of the big ramifications coming out of the pandemic and the public health emergency, which the Biden administration kept in place for three years, is a dramatically expanded Medicaid program. So about 20 million more people on Medicaid um, in early 2023 than before the pandemic. And this is because Congress, Congress was concerned at the start of the pandemic that people would lose their jobs and lose their health insurance. They were also concerned that states would be in a bad fiscal situation. So what they did, they tried to address both of those problems by providing states additional money through Medicaid, only if states took no action to remove ineligible people from the program for the entirety of the public health emergency. So normally about 300,000 people come on to Medicaid and come off every month, right? A lot of low income people are not low income for that long. So right. you get a job, you get health insurance through your job, you come off of the welfare program. Like Medicaid is a welfare program. That didn't happen for three years. So states starting in April have tried to have been, have been allowed to start redoing reviews of eligibility and removals. And some states have been more aggressive um, than others. They, uh, uh, in my view, have done a much more efficient job of making sure that Medicaid is just for those people that are eligible. This whole issue also shows the enormous amount of misinformation um, that comes from the left abetted by the media because they're telling sort of these stories of people who are caught in their their narrative is basically well people are caught in red tape they're um uh, the state's failing to do the proper outreach uh to them and they're being removed from the medicaid program even though they're still eligible that ignores the fact that there's 20 million people on the program who are not eligible Right. And the independent groups suggest that more than half of them are either are already enrolled in an employer plan or have an offer of an employer plan. It should be on an employer plan. And very few of them will not have access to other affordable coverage. We're not going to be increasing the number of people with health insurance that much. And they also neglect something called uh, Medicaid retroactive eligibility, hmm. which basically means if you are still eligible for Medicaid and you are not enrolled, and let's say you have a health care need and you go to the hospital, if you're eligible for the program, the hospital will sign you up on site 
your expenses will be paid for at visit. And for most people, the uh, Medicaid program will pay for their last three months of visits as well. Let me make one other point. Sorry for yeah, long-winded. They are right. It shows the cronyism involved in the healthcare sector too. The yeah. big winners of ineligible people on the Medicaid program are health insurance companies. Almost everybody enrolled in Medicaid is covered through a health insurance company. And the government, whether they're eligible or not, will send that health insurance company a monthly check to pay for the services for those individuals. And a lot of these people who have moved off of Medicaid, who've gotten a job, they don't even know they're on Medicaid. They haven't used a Medicaid program in a year or longer, yet mm -hmm. the insurance company is still receiving a monthly check from them. And it's sort of the nexus in a lot of this, this of big government and big industry um, is that are both uh, sort of pushing these sort of more subsidies, more regulation, government programs. Yeah. Wow. Uh, key facts there, Brian. And one thing I like to say on the program is that, you know, government doesn't stimulate anything else except more government. <laughs> and, you're, and you're making another key point about that here. I, I was looking over, you know, these couple of papers. I think the first one was Freedom Wins. States with less restrictive COVID policies outperform states with more restrictive COVID policies. I'll be sure to put that on the show notes page. And there's there's a lot of other good stuff that the the, the audience should definitely go out and check out, paragoninstitute.org. Uh, I know Paul Winfrey, who we've had on the program, the contribute he wrote the contribution of federal health programs to US fiscal challenges and the need for reform. But there are several others here that that I think the audience should definitely go and check out to take a deeper dive into these areas because they they are so important. They're influencing our lives, they're influencing our pocketbook and and the future. The future of America. I mean, I think between the two biggest sectors of our economy, healthcare and education, are really being dominated by government. And we wonder why we're not getting the outcomes. We're spending all this money. And um, I think the United States still spends the most out of any other country on healthcare. And, and our outcomes are, are not that impressive. They're, they're, they're pretty good, but they're, but they're not impressive considering how much that we're spending per capita and everything else. You know, and I remember there was some talk about at the White House and and, and, um, and here in closing, Brian, you know, you and I, we were both worked at the White House and uh, the Trump administration. I think we were talking yesterday. I think we b barely missed each other. There's so much that you learn from from that situation. And with healthcare being as important as it is, we, we've really got to get it right at, at some point. I mean, I think that and I've worked a little bit on this on, on Medicaid reform and different areas of working at the state level. Uh, I saw Nick Horton was another co-author. I had him on the program here recently too. Great, great guy up at Opportunity Arkansas. We've got to figure out a way, I think, to ultimately get it back to where it's the patient and the doctor again. Instead of having these middlemen, the third party payment system really creates a lot of problems because you don't have the price signals to allocate resources the best way. And I know a lot of people don't want to talk about it, that you know the, the healthcare industry is different, but, but I believe the market works best in every industry, uh, especially healthcare and education, the, the two that have so much influence in our lives. Why would we not want that like we have with TVs and, and everything else you know that, that makes our lives better? We need that more in healthcare, which is one reason why I think America does so great, is that we have these new innovations, we have the research and development um, and, and patents and everything else. But we've really got to make sure that government doesn't crowd out the innovation and the new things that are going to happen for the future. And so, um, Brian, I really appreciate all the work you're doing. And, and as we're closing this out now, you know, you respond to any of that. But but anything else that you see that kind of makes you optimistic about the future? I had a lot of people on now, Brian, and, and some are dire. <laughs> like uh, Michael Munger, he was like, man, I, I just don't know. There, there's a lot stress that's going on in the future you know how he is and um and peter betke as well but but like you know I, i'm more of an optimistic economist but those things don't always go together and, and a lot of that's because of my faith you know and, and being a christian and everything else but but I, but i think we will get this stuff right we might have to wait for a crisis to not to not let a crisis go to waste in, in a good way but 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 brian what, what what are you thinking about you know where we're at and and, and where we're heading and the optimism here in our um, our closing time together i know it's a lot to throw at you at one time <laughs> Let me start with um, the case for, for the negative. I think we, American life expectancy has done it. That's one of the main measures we have of health is how long people live. Like it's a very objective measure. And corresponding with um, the start of Obamacare actually, for three straight years, 2014 to 2017, American life expend expectancy uh, declined. And that was the first decline like that in a century. Uh, you have to go back to sort of the Spanish flu, the 1918. 
uh, mm-hmm. period. And I think in a lot of ways, people's overall health is affected by some trends in society that just aren't aren't helpful. So obviously the um, the opioid uh, crisis that happened. Um, some economists have referred to that as deaths of despair. And I think sort of the polarization, social media, sort of the, um, and you get some of this with like just loneliness and um, the sort of radical decline in community, radical decline in church attendance. There are some things that are deeply important for health. Marriage is something that is really um, uh, strongly correlated with good health outcomes. So in my view, one of the things like for Paragon is we want to focus on what actually helps people live their most productive, um, fulfilling lives. And way too much of government policy is focused on whether you have a health insurance card. Yeah. Like to the extent that we can like stop fighting about universal coverage, it's just not that important yeah. um, for people's overall well-being. There's just much more important things. And a lot of it comes from sort of basic uh, you know, conservative values of faith, family, community, um, and productive work. So I think this, this, where we can emphasize that, and there's sort of a lot of overlap, I know, in the work that you do to try to, you know, reduce the burden of governments um, and, and help people live their most prosperous lives. I do think there is a tremendous potential, like the American, so on the positive side, uh, Operation Warp Speed and the fact that we could develop a vaccine really almost, I mean, the, the vaccine formula was developed uh, really sort of before the pandemic even started. Hmm. And then it took a while to get through the regulatory approval process. Um, but just the fact that we do have an incredibly innovative uh, healthcare sector in parts, like I think the pharmaceutical sector has um, a lot of innovation. And, you know, as long as government's not in the way, not there picking winners and losers, I think there is the potential for a lot of um, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship in, uh, to improve uh, medical care. Yeah, and, uh, there's a lot of uh, sound points that you make there, Brian, and I think it gives us a lot to think about. Hopefully the audience has a lot to think about as we've been going through a lot of issues. And, and you know, time flies when you're having fun, I guess, when talking about this. And there, there is so much to to talk about and, and work on in this space. So I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I'll, I have to have you back on so we can talk about some other things as, as well. Um, but uh, but with that, you know, Brian, um, God bless you and your family and continue to, to do the great things you're doing. Thank you, Vance. Happy Thanks. to come back on. Okay, great. And, and for the audience, um, please leave us a five-star rating. If you liked it, share with your friends and family on social media or however you want to do it. Uh, and you can find this on all the out major outlets that are out there. And until next time, let people prosper.